welcome to the Fuelin Race Ready webinar. We have a solid presentation today on everything that you kind of the checklist you want to go through in these last couple of weeks leading up to your race. So I'm going to share my screen. Race ready. Let's do you. All right. As always, if questions pop up throughout, there's only a couple of us on, so feel free to jump in. Otherwise, we can save them until the end, and I will go over for review. So today, getting race ready. Timelines, what you want to be considering from your race day, moving backwards. Key Five key considerations in order to get race ready. We talk about carb capacity, carb loading. You all know what that we discussed it ad nauseum, I feel, but important for performance, and then a little time for Q&A at the end. All right, so looking at that, if we start back, so if your race is November 1st, let's say count back 12 weeks, and this is where you're going to start, get out the calendar, mark back 12 weeks at a minimum, sweat testing, carb testing, aka gut training, and then some race simulations. As we're going to review in the app, and hopefully the Fuel and Family knows this, there are two sections, one for sweat testing, one for carb testing. With sweat testing, that is doing sessions 60 minutes or longer, ideally in a situation where you can weigh yourself immediately before and immediately after. Uh, we like those hotter temperatures, higher intensity for the sweat, te sweat testing. As for the carbohydrate testing, aka gut training, this is when we are looking at how many carbohydrates you're consuming an hour. And then let's say you're starting at 30 or 60, which most of the new athletes that come to the Fuel and App are about at. And we are going to try to be working you up over these 12 weeks to get closer to that 90 to 120 grams of carbohydrates. As you enter your carb tests, the app will start building you up organically. So it's important that you are entering this information. It is not just for us. It is not just uh, to try to hold you accountable. It is to help you increase carbohydrate consumption and really get your gut trained and ready for consuming higher amounts of carbohydrates. It's also when you want to be doing those race sims, brick sessions, bike run, swim bike, uh, so that we have practice sessions for actual higher intensity, longer duration. What does it feel like to consume a lot of carbohydrates on the bike and then immediately go to a run? What does it feel like to eat, practice your race breakfast? go straight to a, an open water swim, and then hop onto the bike afterwards. At six to basically two weeks out, you're going to be repeating race simulations. You're going to be practicing your race nutrition setup. This is something that surprisingly a lot of athletes will get to race day and not have actually spent time doing the logistics. I think we can all remember when we started triathlon, at least I did, was that practicing your transitions, I remember the first time I tried to do a flying dismount, it was absolutely catastrophic. Did like I should have known that it was not going to go well. It did not go well. I took myself and two other people out. Um, the same way that we are like practicing how you set up your transition, the same thing goes with your race, race nutrition. It's one thing to practice on those long rides when you're getting on, off, off the bike, getting on when you're on the trainer at home and you have a stand next to you with all the bottles and the food lined up, it's entirely different when you have to transport all of that in your race kit, in your bento box. How many bottles do you have? How are you going to fill up along the way? If your bike only hold, holds two bottles and you need you know, six throughout your race, when are you going to refill those? How are you going to refill those? Practicing grabbing from the back. I know it sounds possibly silly or repetitive, but a lot of athletes won't actually practice using both of those hands, grabbing bottles. If you can, I enlisted family members 
So because I was not great about grabbing bottles whilst also moving in the forward direction. So my mother, gosh bless her, stood out on the side of the road on like our country road and just, I just went back and forth and would she'd hand, she'd hold water bottles out and as cute moms do, she'd be like, great job. And I'm like, it's not a race, but thank you very much. (laughs) So practicing those components, how are you going to hold if you need, think of a wild number, if you need 20 gels, where are you going to put all of those? If you need to carry powders, if you need to, you know, if you're going to be munching on bars or whatever, where are those going to go? How are you going to utilize them? Uh, Practice carbohydrate loading. It's not just race week. I always like athletes to practice carb loading at least once, preferably twice in those six weeks. I even like eight. I kind of like to do it at the eight week and the four week marker so that you know, one, how you're going to do it. Because athletes, if they're consuming 250 to 300 grams of carbs in a day and then asking them to consume 550, it can be overwhelming. They don't know how they're going to do it. Also, if athletes only go the, well, I'm just going to eat pasta and bagels and rice, and then they're messaging me in the chat, in the app saying, I'm constipated. What do I do? (laughs) And it's like, (laughs) well, you shouldn't have consumed 550 grams of carbohydrates in bread. Like that's, that's gonna, it's gonna mess up the digestive system. So you want to be able to be confident and know because your body's going to feel different when you're carb loading. A lot of athletes, myself included, can feel a little bloated and a little full and this kind of this uncomfortable feeling. And so if you've never experienced that before, race week is not the first time to be going in and going, oh, you know, you have a lot of other things to worry about. So you ideally will practice carb loading at least for a day or two, several weeks out. Practicing your race day breakfast. I recommend starting this for every, if Saturdays are your long rides or brick sessions, it doesn't hurt to practice it two dozen times. If I know I'm racing in October and it's January, I'm going to start practicing on Saturdays on my long ride. Get down what you're going to have race morning, include the coffee, include the foods, include your hydration, whatever that's going to be. I also recommend having a few mornings where you wake up at the time you're actually going to be waking up on race day. So if that's 3.30, pick a couple Saturdays. I know it's not great. No, it's not fun, but it's a lot different to practice your race day breakfast at 3.30 in the morning than it is to practice your race day breakfast at 6.30 in the morning before you go out for a Saturday ride. Just a recommendation, try it out. Um, And then ordering any products required for your race. So if you are six or so weeks out and you know, I only like precision gels, I only like SOS hydration, and I only like, you know, scratch chews. These are the, this is what I have and this is how much of it I'm gonna need. Order it six or four to six weeks out and set it aside so that you don't have to worry that something's not going to come in time, that you're going to run out. I can't tell you how many times athletes have said, these are on back order. I can't get them. I'll have to ship them to my hotel and hope that they're there in time. Those of us that are type A, like I haven't raced in two years and I still could like go into my cabinet and probably get out exactly what my race nutrition was because I ordered enough to last me for 10 races. Because I wanted no stone, like I, I didn't want any surprises. I wanted to be sure that I had enough. Elliot, I know you're the same way. Gosh bless you. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then two weeks out from your race, this is when we want to do that heat protocol. Either the hot water immersion or the sauna, especially if you're racing somewhere like Kona where you know you are going to be dealing with the heat, the wind, these elements that make it, you know, I'd say the last few years in most parts of the United States, we've had a crazy heat wave. And so it's not uncommon to have 110 degree weather in Northern California. It's not uncommon to have 95 degrees and 95% humidity in Atlanta. Regardless, 
take that time. If you do not, I would recommend doing it even if you do live somewhere that's hot. Hot water immersion, sauna protocol, refine your process, go through everything again, go through your checklists, take any guesswork, any stress out of the equation. Now, actual 24 hour timeline before your race. This is where you're gonna do your pre-race dinner, which again, if you are like me, you have practiced that multiple Friday evenings, you know exactly what you're going to have. It's not gonna be some kind of surprise. You're not just gonna show up at the race and either in your hotel or your Airbnb and go, where should we go for dinner? What should I have? It's 6.30 p.m., two to three hours before bed. So if you are gonna try to be in bed at 8 p.m., which I recommend if you're waking up at 3 or 3.30, dinner is 5, 5.30, 6 at the latest. You're gonna have a green meal. This is 100 grams of carbohydrates or more. I personally love chicken thighs or salmon as kind of my protein source. Roasted potatoes, white rice, something very simple, uh, possibly some bread on the side, potentially, you know, I'll have like a glass or two of tart cherry juice because that helps me with sleep. Uh, listed here, white rice, chicken, or a plant protein, tomato-based sauce, and then your water and electrolyte mix, always before uh, before bed. I think it's a great practice. At least water, I do electrolytes. Then race day breakfast, two to three hours before start. Another green meal, 100 grams of carbohydrates or more. Um, with All with this, the overnight protein oats with a big fruit salad, maybe some honey drizzled on the top. Toast, at least two slices. Almond butter and peanut butter and jam, some hard boiled eggs. I happen to love a cinnamon raisin English muffin or bagel as my toast. Uh, along with oatmeal and the protein shake. And then you've got that pre-swim, which hopefully you've practiced several times in open water, uh, 60 minutes or so before caffeine, whether that's in the form of caffeinated gel, uh, caffeinated pill. And this is where experimenting with caffeine multiple times leading up to the race is very important. Everybody responds differently to caffeine. You need to know how your body's going to react. You need to know how long it takes you to feel that boost. You need to know what form is going to work for you. Uh, 15 to 20 minutes before ideally is when you'd have that gel kind of sipping on fluids throughout. Everybody's slightly different. Some people like to have bars. Some people like to have bananas. Some people like to do hydration mixes before. Um, whatever that is for you, ideally you've practiced it. And that is your pre like 60 minutes before swim start, start that, start that countdown. All right. Again, your key considerations, individuality, just because it works or it's something we suggested on one of the webinars or it's what your friends have done or it's what you've done in the past. Every athlete is different. Every race is different. As we get older, things change. As we get in better shape, as we're more accustomed to racing, things change. So you constantly want to be evolving your plan, your training. Again, not just your physical training, gut training, mental training. These are all important to take in. The kind of relief from anxiety I get knowing, okay, I've trained as hard as I can and I have practiced my race nutrition and I've done like the only things now I have to worry about are what comes at me unexpectedly on race day. So by taking the time 12 weeks or so out, you are giving yourself the opportunity to put all of this stuff on the back burner and save your decision-making and your focus for navigating the race for mentally being present and then adjusting as need be to the circumstances that arise on race day. Carbohydrates need to be carb loading, need to be consuming high amounts of carbohydrates about the 48 hours leading up to, and then certainly throughout the race. Repetition, you have practiced over and over and over again. You know your hydration plan, you know how you're going 
to hydrate while you travel, the days leading up to, during the race, certainly, and then afterwards to help with recovery and race day simulations. If you're not practicing your race nutrition on those zone three, four sessions, on those brick sessions, it's not going to do, it's very easy to consume. I mean, I've seen people consume like sandwiches, you know, on these long hundred mile training rides, very different zone two to zone three, four in race day. When you also have nerves, when you're also trying to navigate a thousand other racers, when you can't just pull over to the side and stop for a bit and unwrap your sandwich or banana or whatever, race day simulations, very important. And I know that the three of you on this webinar know this, but your carb capacity test, don't guess. Logging your results, multiple tests, ideally 10, at least 10. Elliot, I can't, I, I think I've lost track at this point. Hundreds of tests you've probably done. <laughs> uh, bike and run different temperatures, different intensities at different times of the season. Again, the earlier you start and the more that you can get in, the better. Now, how you're going to do it. The app is very intuitive and gives you instructions along the way. But for those that don't know, as after you do your session, you're going to go into complete a carb test, uh, carb capacity Session type, you're going to choose, you're going to select the duration, the distance, the intensity, you've got race pace, yes or no, indoors, outdoors, the temperature, humidity, and that's once you've got kind of the basics, and you're going to go with carb, the carb, the actual carb data, solid, fluid, how you felt, uh, were you full? Did it feel heavy? Was there any GI discomfort? And I always recommend the more that you can put in the comment section, the better. And it, it for two reasons. One, for you, because if you're doing a lot of these, as the season progresses, I want you to be able to go back and look and say, yep, this was a great day. Oh, I know why, you know, the usual things that I consumed didn't work today. Oh, it was 20 degrees hotter or the wind came up or whatever, it will give you guidance and reminders as to what was going on during those sessions. It will also help as we recommend if your race gets closer. I know Manny and I are working right now. If you want to do a consult, it's very helpful to for myself or Alan or Scott to go back and look and read through some of these notes and really see what was going on in the different sessions, and that helps us help you. So the more information that you can put in there, the better. Uh, again, just a visual for those in case you haven't done it yet. Selecting, you can select how much, you can add, you can subtract. Uh, you will get the reading of how many grams of carbohydrates, click add, and then you will see over here on the right, how many carbs you've consumed for solid versus liquid, the total grams per hour, the total grams per hour per kilogram of body weight, any kind of GI discomfort, and then a breakdown of exactly what you consume. So you've got that, you've got the date of the test, the type of the session, and then all of the information there that we can build on as you go. Green always the color that we are looking for. And as you can see, this 94 on this carb test, like great, good, great. Uh, same thing, 106 grams per hour. Yes, Elliot. So uh, just looking at this, you know, I haven't logged a ton of zone two, like long rides or long runs because Usually when you go to log them, there's a little box that pops up saying, well, you really, we really only want zone three to five, but clearly you're tracking zone ones and twos. So should I just be ignoring that box? And because I do a lot of, you know, three to five yeah. hour rides where I'm doing, you know, full on feeding. Yeah. But I'm, I'm not recording those. 
necessarily because they're not zone three to fives. So the message is, is kind of there for two reasons. One, a lot of athletes aren't, they're not recording as many as you are. It's kind of very sparse, like very far and few between. And so they might put in one or two here or there, and they're almost always those zone one, zone two rides. And so we found that if we gave a reminder that ideally ah, okay. zone three, five, those are those, and, and that's what the app will take into consideration as we are trying to increase carb capacity right. and gut tolerance. So it's not that you can't, and it's not that there's anything wrong with it. However, right. the benefit comes from the zone three, five. Before. Right. Oh, but but I'm also saying that it is tracked, and I I see I was toggling back and forth, so they're yeah. they're showing different because you're feeding differently. Exactly, exactly, and I think a lot of that, which is a surprise, it was a surprise to me. There are a lot of athletes whose coaches really don't put a lot of race sim right. uh, training sessions until like eight weeks before, maybe six weeks, and it's and then they've only got one or two, and so. In our mind, it's better to have any data than no data because at least that gives us something to go off of and at the very least encourages you as the athlete to start increasing carbohydrate consumption and start actually paying attention to it. Right. Okay. All right. That's that's helpful. I just I just yeah, realized no. that when I was looking at this. Well, you know, for those of us that are doing Ironman, Ultra Runs, yeah. Ultraman, we're doing those race paces zone two yep. on the on the ultras yep so and that's, that's relevant where, yeah it would be important to have like in those ultraman situations like yeah my zone two this is what i'm going to be doing in the race so that's also where that data could come in and be included. okay cool sorry Great. sorry to distract no 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 that was the really spot on question I have a question. Yes. Is there a minimum uh, duration for a carb test? One hour, two hour, three hour? What's, what's the optimal? At, I, at the minimum, an hour. Optimal to me is about 90 minutes as, as a coach trying to get an idea of what your gut looks like. 90 minutes or more, at least for bike sessions. A lot of times athletes will only have race pace sessions if they're like track sessions or maybe interval sessions. And those a lot of the time aren't two hours. They're more like 45 to 60 minutes. And so in that case, if, if you're an athlete that doesn't do a lot of race pace running or high intensity running, then that's when 60 minutes, 50 to 60 minutes is still um, worthwhile so that we at least have some data for you in there. So at least 90 minutes for the bike and one hour for the run. Yeah, that's kind of what I like. And obviously the longer, the better, but at a minimum, that's pretty much about right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So race ready, <laughs> reduce fiber intake 24 to 48 hours prior very one time you will hear Scott or Alan or myself say, you know, cut back on the veggies. We don't have to have the, you know, handfuls of greens and the five to seven serves. Um, it's okay because we are increasing carbohydrate consumption and we're giving your gut a break for a bit. Uh, again, as I said, this is something to practice. FODMAPs, 24 to 48 hours. These are those foods that potentially cause issues in some athletes uh, that could cause GI distress. The morning breakfast, this is where you actually get to include some fiber because as Alan has spoken about before, that fiber is heat protectant is I guess the way to say it in that it the fiber helps your gut uh, protect it from the heat that you're going to be experiencing during racing and therefore make it easier for you to digest the foods, carbohydrates that you're consuming. Carb loading, at least eight grams per kilogram of body weight. The app does that for you as long as you have your race entered. It tell you how many times athletes have said, I don't think I'm carb 
loading this week and it's because they don't have a race entered. They're the only ones that know they have a race coming up. Practicing at least 24 hours before uh, and then your hydration. The goal, peeing clear, consuming electrolytes and obviously practicing. In case you didn't notice the one thing listed in all of these and listed over the course of the time, the 12 week timeline, practice, practice, practice. All right, so some key takeaways. <laughs> Being race ready takes practice. Once is never enough. Nutrition is no different from training. The other thing that I see athletes do is they will, you know, we'll practice like we'll practice a couple times and they'll be like, oh yeah, I've got this. Like I'm up to 100 grams of carbs an hour. I feel good. I feel like I have a plan. And that's six weeks out. And then they don't practice it again or they don't think about it again until race day. And I want to remind you, just because you get it right doesn't mean you shouldn't keep continuing to practice it over and over and over again. Work on your weaknesses. If you're not great, oh, that's weird. If you are not great, I don't know why my screen did that, at uh, drinking on the bike, then by all means, practice. Make sure that you are practicing that. Um, and then, let me shut down. Pull this all the way back up. We lost your charts. Well, I don't know. Uh, I don't know where they went. Doesn't surprise me that my laptop will open it back up. Uh, it was the that it was, this was our last slide anyway, so it's okay that none of us can see. <laughs> um, and then utilizing the app so that we have data. It can help you to evolve carb sweat testing, map those 12 weeks out, take away the guesswork, everybody wins. We have a successful race, at least from a nutrition standpoint. All right, questions on any of the things we discussed or any race ready questions in general? It could be about travel, it could be um, suggestions on how on foods to travel with. I know Alan covered that, but if you weren't in for um, or haven't listened to that session yet, nope. Okay. All right. No, just some good reminders. I just, I actually just ordered some stuff today, but uh, I need, it's a good reminder to go into my cupboard and I'm <laughs> sure I haven't, I'm sure I have enough. Um, for the race, but it's a good time to order. Um, and I'm nine and a half weeks out. And so you haven't seen many sweat and carb tests for me recently because I've been doing a lot of, well, there were a few other things going on. Yeah, also a, lot of, a lot of zone one and zone two stuff. Um, but I will start putting those in and uh, get that number higher. <laughs> Do you know about where you're at right now? In have terms you, of? In terms of your like sweat testing, since we haven't seen any, do you? Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's pretty consistent. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm, as I've, this last couple of years, ironically, maybe it's because I live here, but I thought I would have ad adapted by now. My sweat rate is certainly higher than it was when I lived in Northern California and um, three years here is not really to go back. So I am, I really, I've been very consciously working on drinking a lot more, being comfortable drinking a lot more. Um, and I've got that all kind of planned out, but um but, you know, I basically practice the eating. The, the people I ride with for three to five hours on Thursdays, they're like, you're eating all the time. 
I say, yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> it's all race practice, you know. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so I, I, you know, I'm. Uh, I'm at a place where my sweat rate is high enough that the entire time on the bike, I'm just going to be drinking nonstop. Well, I, I remember your sweat rate was significant was high three years ago. Um, so I mean, it's, that's, that's interesting that it hasn't adjusted. No, no, it has not. So, but uh, so we'll see. And it's you know, and I, and I've had a, the last couple of Ironmans were very hot races. So um, Arizona in November should be should be should be okay. So it'll be 70s, which will be fine. Yeah. And it's dry. Yes, so. very nice. Although every that's the thing with Arizona. I feel like every few years, it's like, oh, torrential downpour, rainstorm. You know, like Arizona is it's consistent until that one year that it's not consistent. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, but, well, I haven't done that race in 14 years. It'll be. Oh, I did it. Wow. I did the. I did it twice in 2008. I did it the last time they used to do it in May, which they stopped doing because it was always 95 degrees and 30 mile an hour winds. And then I did it in November, and then I did it the next November. But That's pretty um, cool. Wow. So it's been it's been a long time. And then that was always a race. It's a little easier now. That was a race that would like fill up five minutes after it opened up. On yeah. Oh, it's, I remember. Cause it's because it's flatter. So. Yep. Yep. It was just, it's the most, it's the most convenient. And I was not going to go back. To <laughs> I've had some, I've had some bad luck with Coeur d'Alene. Speaking of 105 degree go. weather. Yes. So yeah. um, anyway, sorry. I didn't know. Arizona's a great race. I, um, that'll be fun. It'll be good. It's, it'll be great for, I mean, you especially like that's just, yeah. Well, and I just put in, I just put it in. I didn't realize I hadn't put it in the fueling <laughs> app. And, uh, so I see there's 10 other people fueling people that will be there. So, so that'll be fun. Yeah. And probably, I don't, can't promise it, but Scott, not Scott, Jonathan or myself might be out there as well. So it's an easy, it, uh, yeah. It's, from so from California, question. Arizona, and Coeur d'Alene are always easy. Yep. Easy. Yeah hops yeah. so i have a question elizabeth okay Manny. so i uh i added a couple of long rides races coming up that are bike races does that matter to anything on the fuel in app uh so because i know like we're working on carb consumption i'm going to use them with you for that okay um and we'll pro I, you know i'm not going to coach you and tell you what to do but in those longer races we might include some race pace intensity 20, 40 minute blocks just to really practice that gut training and make sure the precision gels are working well and you're not, you're used to them. Merlin. But in general, a lot of the longer bike, you know, the century rides and whatnot are very zone one, two. So not ideal for race practice or simulation, but excellent for gut training. Right. Because I just added the two. Uh, I have a 50 miler October seventh or something and then i have a 63 miler in uh, november 11th or something like that yes we will use those for sure practice wise okay and then the other question i had had to do with supplements we always talk about uh carb uh you know uh, carb loading fueling uh throughout the race but what about some of these other supplements like we mentioned on our call um nitric oxide uh anti-fatigue is it is that something you want to mess with? Does it matter? Um, it depends on the athlete. Depends on the race. I know our thanks. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I'd say for you, we'll probably like caffeine. We'll definitely look at incorporating nitrates. Yes, we just did a post. Fuel and just did a post on Instagram about that today. I think that could be potential. I don't think we'll use sodium bicarbonate for you. I don't think so athlete dependent. It's worth looking into if you've had certain issues in the past, but um, not necessarily for everybody. I would say spend, 
it's very easy to want to like grab on to these called miracle supplements. And then everybody skips the basics. Like, no, just practice your sweat testing, your carbs, like get that down. That's that foundational component. And a lot of the times that tiny 1%, and even if, you know, a lot of like the beetroot nitrate studies, the performance benefits are either like for very elite athletes, like that's what they've been testing them on and or athletes that are very new to, so sedentary to new athletes. Um, so highly individual would be the appropriate answer. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right. All right. Well, great to see your faces. Thanks so much for taking the time to tune in. Elliot, I'm glad your race is in now and we can start <laughs> we can start working, getting some sweat. Well, it's, it's 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 far enough out, so it wasn't gonna be a problem. But yeah, yeah I just uh, just one of those things. So um, I'm I've been a little I've been a little distracted the last couple of months. Yeah, I'd say so. Uh, I'd say so. Bye, Manny. All right. Anyway, great. great. great to Glad see all you. is well. And since it's just you and I now, oh, hold on. Stop that.